this is a day that I've been looking forward to for I don't know how many years now. You can probably tell how many years just based on the thumbnail I'm putting up on the screen. It was unfortunate that I wanted to make a video on this machine and I never could because the original unit I had was stolen and it was the balls to the walls config in basically mint condition. And with these machines growing ever harder to find in nice shape or even working for that matter, I'll elaborate on that here shortly. I, the fact that I found the machine that I found is kind of impressive. So without further delay, let's get this video done and over with and let's check out this gem of a netbook from 2008 or thereabouts. The HP Mini Note 2133. So what makes the Mini Note 2133 unique? Well, I'll elaborate on that shortly, but to, be, to put it this way, this is one of those unusual netbooks that you just never saw, particularly even when they were new, as this was supposed to be a business class derived product, as you can see from the exterior build being made out of aluminum and magnesium, which is quite a unique construction for a netbook. Most of the time you only saw those in the higher end business class netbooks, well not netbooks, but uh, notebooks and mobile workstations from even HP themselves, but more or less other manufacturers too. So that's one thing that kind of sets this netbook and for that matter its successor apart. But let me elaborate a little bit. So the HP 2133 was meant to be a business class netbook derived for people who were looking for something that was small but very capable. It had a a very large keyboard. It had a high resolution display for a netbook and it was supposed to be very portable and obviously it was meant to withstand some business use. It also has built-in sensors like HP's 3D drive guard which would protect the hard drive from sudden drops and shocks so it would actually try to prevent data loss which was a very unique feature back in the day. Of course Apple patented it in the PowerBook days but HP had their own addition in this machine, which is a very unique touch. But there's more to stuff like the drive drop protection, like I just referred to. There's some other things like I referred to the build quality, and well, to put it this way, there is just a lot to cover that makes this netbook kind of sort of stand out. Not the least of which is because of one of the operating systems that you could have ordered this machine with. Check out that glorious badge there. And we'll get onto that shortly. Now, you might be thinking to yourself, well, isn't this just another one of those boring Intel Atom netbooks? Well, um, actually, no. That was its successor, which was the Mini Note 2140. That actually featured an Intel Atom N270 processor. This, however, predates the Intel Atom by about, I would say, give or take six months or so. Maybe I'm give or taking on the time. But this machine actually featured the Via C7M processor with integrated Chrome 9 graphics. So yeah, this predates the Intel Atom, which means that um, <laughs> the performance of this was not very good. It was going to be superseded, and it definitely was, and the performance at least for a netbook was way better in its successor model, but whatever. Now, the starting configuration for this machine was about 499 US dollars in 2008 money. I'll have a little subtitle for the inflation cost. What that got you was the entry level Linux version with four gigabytes of onboard SSD storage. Yes, four whole gigabytes of SSD storage. Not a whole heck of a lot to go about, but um, I believe that also included the standard entry level configurations being that you would have gotten a single 512 megabyte stick of DDR2 RAM as well as, I believe, a 1 gigahertz via C7M CPU. Now, the configuration that I have is kind of a mid-step configuration, or at least it was before I did a little bit of work to it to upgrade the RAM, which I did max it out. But this one has the mid-step 1.2 gigahertz via C7M CPU, and it has the 120 gigabyte SATA hard drive that spins at 5200 RPM, or maybe it's somewhere in thereabouts, but it's a 120 gigabyte hard drive. That was the mid configuration option. This also has the upgraded display panel, which on this machine measures at 8.9 inches with a resolution of 1280 by 768, which is actually pretty good for a netbook. 
the other display option would have been the 1024 by 600 display at the same size. But, you know, having 1280 by 768 on a display of this size meant you got a pretty respectable pixel density, which was actually respectable for the time period for a computer this size. That was actually quite good. Now, whether or not the hardware could drive it was another thing entirely, but, you know, at least you had that. A couple of other unique things. This was actually covered via plexiglass, which was a very unique feature. It wasn't just a straight exposed display panel or, you know, a straight piece of glass. It would just use plexiglass. So a unique feature for this machine anyway. It wasn't necessarily the most scratch resistant, but it was definitely, uh, it was definitely <laughs> there. Not sure how else to really put it. Another unique feature you might be able to see is these front facing speakers. This was unique to the 2133 as the 2140 increased the display size to a full 10 inch display, which meant that the speakers got repositioned in the computer. So while you did get a bigger screen on the successive model, you lost these front facing speakers. And I think that was actually a, a, a point going for this machine because the speakers, as you'll soon hear when I demonstrate them are actually surprisingly decent for a computer this size. Also surprisingly decent for a computer this size, look at that keyboard. Like, it's huge for this machine. I believe it's a 92% full-size scale keyboard, which was actually a selling point of this netbook. As you can see, there's no numeric pad. Obviously, it's not going to fit on a machine of this size. But HP actually did a pretty good job of integrating a lot of the keys into function keys and just giving you what looked like a very expansive keyboard with all the keys that you actually care about for typing on. And they actually had a pretty reasonable amount of key travel with a satisfying enough key switch for a machine that you would think would be business class, at least as far as HP's marketing was concerned. And it actually meant that if you needed something small for typing documents for long periods of time and you wanted it to be as small as possible, well, here you go. This thing was absolutely killing it, other than maybe the uh, very small at the time uh, I was going to say PowerBook, but uh, Apple would have stopped selling those in 2008. So you would have had the 13-inch uh, MacBooks of the day and the 15-inch MacBook Pro. But this has a very comparable enough feeling keyboard to one of those that I would say that this is pretty much right up there with them. What's not is the trackpad. I mean, look at how absolutely tiny this trackpad is. It's absolutely abysmal. <laughs> And a unique thing was they actually made a trade-off with the mouse buttons, and instead of compromising on the touchpad space, they actually put the mouse buttons on either side of the trackpad to try to maximize the amount of space that you would have for your finger to move around. And that was just the direct result of making the keyboard so effing huge because, well, I'm pretty sure people would prioritize this over having a quality touchpad because that wasn't the point of this machine, I'm absolutely certain. But whatever, I mean, people are here to digress, so that is what it is. This machine also had a built-in VGA resolution webcam. Uh, well, you know, if you want the actual resolution, it was 640 by 480, and it just lived up here. No privacy switch or anything of that nature. This was before people were paranoia about the government spying on them for whatever it's worth, even though the government literally does not spy on your computer through the webcam. <laughs> Anyways, um, my opinions aside, so other aspects about this machine were, of course, the build quality, as I've hinted towards before. The machine itself, the top here is made of aluminum, and so is the bottom made of aluminum. I believe the frame on the inside is made of magnesium, and, you know, here's obviously your little plastic overlay uh, or painted plastic overlay for your Wi-Fi and Bluetooth to go through if your machine was so equipped. And of course, that just meant that this machine felt more premium, it was more durable, and it was definitely more expensive as a direct result. Of course, compared to the consumer models, which were all made of plastic, this feels a lot more substantial and probably what makes it look so different compared to most netbooks that you would have seen back in the day, especially ones that were coming out in the Intel Atom era. It wasn't all cupcakes and sunshine though for this machine. There was definitely some problems, not the least of which was the VIA processor itself was known to run very hot on the, uh, under load especially. Um, what would be the common occurrence with these machines was the cooling was not so much uh, inadequate. It was just the way that HP designed the machine, unfortunately. So one of the quality problems was this little mesh 
in front of the uh, vent here. This would block a substantial amount of your airflow from uh, uh, you know, allowing the fan to blow hot air out this vent. And you do have an underside intake here, which is nice, but um, it did result in the machine getting very warm underneath. And this machine definitely has that problem, trust me. Um, and also, people's machines would just die. Uh, they would just stop turning on because the chip would effectively cook itself. Now, there are some remediations that you can do for this, uh, not the least of which is opening up the computer and applying a repaste of some higher quality thermal paste. But also, another thing that people have done to mitigate the situation is they just take this mesh out and that helps improve the airflow. I haven't done it with this machine because, well, I just got it not that long ago and it's all original except for the RAM upgrade I actually performed on it. But, you know, obviously that's kind of an important thing for what I would want to do with this machine. So haven't yet addressed the CPU. This machine still boots up just fine, but it is still something that if you're wanting to get one of these machines for some reason, do keep that in mind. That is very important that you make sure you get at least some kind of a repaste job completed on a machine like this. You will need Torx drivers to get into it. Uh, there's Phillips screws underneath the battery that'll pop out the keyboard, but after that, it's Torx screws, so you want to pay attention to that. Look up a disassembly guide online. It'll tell you how you do it. Uh, these machines aren't the most difficult to get into. They just are, well, an HP business class notebook of the day, so they are a little bit complicated, but you'll figure it out. It's not that bad. So enough rambling. Let's discuss some other aspects of this machine, like its I.O. Now, of course, like most netbooks, uh, this has built-in VGA port without the screws. Uh, this right here is actually a port for a USB docking station that HP would have sold you on one of these things. You can see the little notched connector there, which I believe would provide some additional power to the dock, as well as standalone microphone and headphone jacks. On the front, there's the power switch because they couldn't fit it underneath because just, of course, the keyboard took up all the room. A hard drive access light, and then this is your Wi-Fi control switch, like an on and off switch for your uh, Wi-Fi and Bluetooth. I wanna say these things are also optional with cellular, but I could be wrong. That might've been the successor model or a completely different model. One thing that is unique about this particular netbook is it was one of the very few netbooks that have ever existed to feature, I believe it was Express Card, I think it was, what was it? Um, Express Card 54 maybe? I think that might have been the slot. I was trying to remember the acronym there, but this was one of the very few netbooks to have ever had that functionality, as well as underneath it, it has a SD card slot. So, you know, woo, that was pretty nice to have. Another USB 2 port, onboard 100 megabit ethernet, and the charging barrel goes in there. Actually, this might have been gigabit, but I don't remember. Um, either way, the CPU would have been probably too weak to take advantage of gigabit anyway, but what do I know, right? As well as a ten Kensington security lock slot right there. And that was your lot, really. Um, of course, other than the other specs you probably could have configured with this machine. Oh, I almost forgot to mention, even when these machines were new, battery life was quite abysmal. Uh, in this machine's case, it wasn't ordered with an additional... Uh, high capacity battery. This is the standard capacity battery that these machines would have came with from HP when they were new. And the estimated runtime, two hours. <laughs> it's pretty bad. Uh, if you got the extended capacity battery, uh, that would extend your runtime by about double. So you get about four hours of runtime out of this machine. So not brilliant, but you know, it was whatever. Uh, Obviously, the Intel Atom versions did way better in the battery life department, probably because they didn't consume so much power. But what do you know, right? So for those who are curious, I'll just do a quick recap of the specs of my machine. So mine has the 1.2 gigahertz via C7M CPU, 120 gigabyte hard drive. This one had one gig of RAM when it was new from HP, but I've upgraded it to the maximum two gigabytes of RAM and has the 1280 by 768 display. It's got the webcam. Uh, this does have Wi-Fi, but I do not believe the Bluetooth option is uh, equipped on this one. And it also was ordered brand new from HP with the uh, Windows Vista Home Basic operating system package, which, yeah, Home Basic for a machine like this seems kind of silly, but I think the reason why this machine would have been ordered with that operating system would probably have been a result of either, number one, this was actually a home machine and so this, the user just didn't want to buy business, or number two, the most likely option, is the reason why they ordered it with Vista Home Basic is so they could save on uh, licensing costs. 
even though these machines technically were compatible with the uh, Windows XP downgrade uh, sort of system at the time, which could have meant that you could have optionally bought these machines from HP with Windows Vista business licenses, and then if you bought them in bulk, then you had the ability to downgrade these to Windows XP Professional officially and then upgrade to Vis Vista Business later, which meant that you saved quite a bit of money on licensing costs. But don't quote me on that. Um, that might have just been another thing entirely. Or like you could have ordered them with Linux and then you could have slapped your own Windows license on them. It wouldn't have mattered anyway. Because, uh, of course, Linux was an option for these machines. I believe it was SUSE Linux that these were ordered with or optionally ordered with from back in the day because it was more of an enterprise -y Linux sort of option for those who actually used Linux, you know, for those who were actually going to use it. I mean, I'm not going to say for or against, but, you know, it was an option on these machines. So why don't you say, with enough of this rambling done and out of the way, let's power this machine on and check it out. All right, so let's get this thing plugged into the charger. And yes, before someone comments, I was using two Mac minis to hold up my camera tripod. You're welcome. <laughs> I'm too cheap to invest in a proper, like, actual tripod and whatnot for my phone that I use as a camera, so fight me, I guess. Oh, it's not camera focus. Whoops, that's not what I had in mind. That's also not what I had in mind. Um, kind of a bit of a side note while this thing powers up here. I'll just go ahead and get it turned on. Uh, I've got a little piece of glass covering the camera lenses on my phone, and so it tends to make the autofocus kind of goofy. So I should probably take that piece of glass off because it's not doing any good. And the camera lenses on them uh, on these phones are durable enough that it really wouldn't make that much of a difference. But I've just been lazy because, you know what? I bought them with my screen protector for my phone. Damn it, I'm going to use them. <laughs> so, no, whatever. So we might be here a bit. This does take a little while for it to boot up but it's not unbearably slow like if you were running this on an unsupported machine, but it is pretty slow, so I'll just time-lapse the boot-up process. And there we are at the desktop of Windows Vista Home Basic. Now, for some reason, the display driver causes some weird glitching like that. That's normal. I think that's really strange, but I haven't found a way to get it to stop doing that whenever it logs in. Perhaps that's something to do with the WDDM driver model and the fact that I'm actually using the uh, the Vista Basic, not the Vista Basic theme, the Vista Standard theme that looks like Arrow, but it's not actually Arrow, if you know what I mean but it's whatever. Uh, the sidebar is set to start up with the machine. I believe that was how it was from the factory. And then there's some other things about this machine too with its original install of Vista that I thought would be worth sharing. If I go into the start menu here, while the sidebar takes a dump there, there's a utility on here called the Software Manager, I believe it was, or no, HP Software Setup, that's what it was called. So we go ahead and launch that here and I'll show you what I mean. All right, and here we are. So I had to run this after running the recovery partition because a lot of the software that this machine would have came with was not actually installed, perhaps for the better, but for the sake of demonstration, I actually did install a lot of the software from this application. And I also did a once over the drivers just to make sure that those were working too. But basically it allows you to install other things like uh, printer drivers, uh, Windows Live Messenger, Roxio Creator Basic if you had an external optical drive connected. Adds HP wallpaper options for Windows. You get Sun Java, which is pretty cool. And then some of the other applications that this came with included the let's see here there was norton antivirus in here there was pdf complete se there was a dvd player application and a dot net framework helping support things so it did come with a few different applications that you could have used to spruce this thing up and uh, give you a little bit more of the software it probably would have shipped with when i was new also for some reason my uh, clock oh there it is <laughs> that was weird uh, no less with Windows Vista's infamous bugs here, just kicking into play, but whatever. Um, so let's go ahead and right click on computer and click on properties here. 
I have done some Windows Update patches, so I've gotten it up to date as far as I can get it anyway. There you can see my two gigabytes of RAM that I've installed into the system. And check out that Windows Experience Index of 1.7. Oh boy. Yeah, this thing was not particularly a powerhouse, even when it was new. Uh, Windows Vista did not treat these machines kindly, and I'm sure a lot of them either got Linux or they got Windows XP as part of their normal life cycle routine. But this one just so happened to unfortunately come with Vista, which is why I've got it. <laughs> Granted, I wanted Vista business, but I will settle for Home Basic. It works just fine. It will do what I needed to do just fine. I honestly probably wouldn't even use Windows Arrow if this machine was running business anyway, because it does tend to bog down the CPU quite a bit. As you might be able to tell, the CPU graph was definitely fluctuating. It is a single core, single thread. There is no multi-threading with this processor, nor would I expect that to have been the case back when it was new. So let's check out some of the things on this machine, at least as far as the HP stuff is concerned. You can, you can kind of tell how high resolution this display is for the size. It makes text on the display very small. So I suspect that a lot of people probably turned on the high DPI mode of Windows at least from the XP and Vista era, to help make the text a little bit larger. Although, honestly, for my eyes, this actually doesn't look too bad, but I can see why people would probably have a little bit of a begrudgingness to keep the 1024 by 600 display or turn text scaling on, as terrible as it is. This does have a trial of Office 2007. This looks like the home and business version, since it includes uh, Outlook, it includes access and so on and so forth. I believe this came with the computer when it was new, which was pretty nice. You do get a webcam application, so you can use the webcam to take photos or to record video onto your hard drive. It's its own dedicated application since at that time uh, Windows didn't have something like that. And there you can see the camera is now enabled. Uh, interestingly, I don't know what it is, but for some reason the preview is upside down. I don't know if that's just a byproduct of the software or what's going on, but it is most definitely upside down. I haven't been able to confirm with other applications, but um, you can also use this application to record voice memos if you wish, although that seems kind of silly. You'd probably use some other dedicated application for that, but who am I to speak, right? Um, PDF Complete was one of the applications that was optionally installable on this machine, so let's go ahead and open that up. Uh, PDF Complete Viewer is kind of like a, uh, not necessarily a copy of Acrobat Reader from the time period, but hey, a built-in PDF reader was always nice, and it's got the user interface of the era to definitely prove that theory, that's for sure. Oh man, this touchpad is ultra sensitive. There you can see PDF Complete 3.0.73 Special Edition. And then let's see what other applications there are here. Uh, sound Max, that's just the sound driver there. Uh, there's the Roxio Creator Basic, which uh, is basically like a non-trial version of their basic application, which allows you to write CDs and DVDs to a certain extent. Um, the HP folder here, whoops, uh, has some utilities in it for health check, system information, and battery check. We could try running the battery check just for funsies, just so it'll tell us that our battery's probably in good health. Uh, this came on not just this machine, but a bunch of HPs from the late 2000s, and uh, it would tell you if your battery's still good or if your battery needs to be replaced or anything like that. This one seems to have the advertised runtime, so yeah, it actually seems like it's doing pretty good. So that actually is believable. It actually still gets its full runtime, about two hours or so. So it's really not that bad. Uh, kind of impressive, really, given I don't know how old this battery is. Uh, under the Hewlett Packard folder, there's a tour of your PC application. Funny enough, actually, when I was setting this machine up, the out of box experience was absolutely tiny on the screen. It was absolutely abysmal in its font size. I could barely read it. Um, but I guess it's whatever. Interestingly, also, that HP software thing had a full copy of the Windows Live Messenger. So let's take a trip down memory lane here for those who used it back in the late 2000s. There you go, there's your sign-in screen with your Windows Live ID. And well, I'm sure people haven't seen a sign-in box like this in well and truly years. Because of course that got merged into Skype and then Skype kind of ended up dying off in and of itself. So, you know, the 
<laughs> the people in the viewing audience are probably going to, like, rest in peace when does Live Messenger. And well and truly for a time, it was actually a pretty good instant messaging client in comparison to the classic Skype that was before the Microsoft purchase or AOL Instant Messenger or some other platforms at the time that may or may not still be around today. Now, as far as modern day applications for this machine are concerned, um, <laughs> well, Vista is Vista and it is pretty old. And not to mention this machine doesn't exactly have a hell of a lot of horsepower on the CPU side. So web browsing is probably not this machine's strong suit, but I did load a fairly current browser known as MyPal, which is essentially a fork of the Pale Moon web browser, which in and of itself is based on the Mozilla Firefox web browser engine. So as you can see, the user interface is very much like Firefox. And I believe the underlying code that my pal is derived from, I believe is Firefox version 68 quantum. So you do get a fairly up-to-date browser. It's not the most up-to-date, but most modern websites will probably work just fine with this browser I found. Um, they haven't yet uh, forked over some other uh, capabilities to this browser because the development kind of got shut down and that's a whole nother mess on github but that's neither here nor there on top of that uh, there's also the windows vista extended kernel but i don't have that installed on this machine it's probably not worth it to do so right now anyway because uh, this machine is currently running a 32-bit version of windows which for vista that's fine that's not really that big of a deal but it uh, just means that you don't nearly have the same amount of application compatibility as the 64-bit version just because a lot of modern applications for our concerns are 64-bit which uh, kind of hurts the 32-bit but that's totally fine so why don't we try to go browse some websites here i think the first one we'll try to browse is going to just be our good friend youtube this is probably going to take a while so i do expect that this machine's web browsing is going to be sped up uh, in post so three two one go so as you might be able to see, yeah, YouTube is not this computer strong suit. In fact, I actually just heard the cooling fan kick up a bit. But as I noted earlier, yeah, there's definitely not a whole heck of a lot of air coming out of that vent. And I'm almost absolutely certain, yeah, the palm rest is a little bit warm. Uh, probably benefit from having a repaste done for sure at the very least. So that way it has fresh thermal paste. I just got to get this machine disassembled. So maybe one of these days when I have some downtime at work, I'll actually consider doing that because that's kind of an important thing. But uh, yeah. <laughs> Not this machine strong suit, but I can't imagine that trying to watch YouTube on this thing anyway would be a good idea just based on the fact that it took several minutes just to load the main homepage. And the browser is currently not responding. Oh, there it goes a little bit. So I guess there's that. I'm not going to do too much more stress testing with this machine because I think we'd get the idea. It's not that machine strong suit anymore. I'm sure that that's down to Vista and the, well, old web browser, but I could also definitely expect that some of that slowdown is caused by the processor being the VSC7M. But we do have Spotify, and I was able to get this to work still. Uh, I believe, I'm not sure how much longer this application is going to be supported for, to be fair with you, but um, it does say that we're ending support for your operating system in an upcoming release. I'm not entirely sure how true that is. They've said that now for years, I'm sure. Um, but they still keep the download for the Vista copy up on their website. And as you can see, it still technically connects. So I guess uh, for a demonstration of the speakers on this machine, I'll do this. I'll actually go ahead and play something that I think is copyright free. I had it queued up before on my Spotify but um, don't quote me on this. I think this should be an NCS sort of thing, so it shouldn't go dinging me for copyright. So honestly, it's really not that bad uh, for the sound system on a netbook. Just keep that in mind, a netbook, not just any specific computer, but a netbook. Like, they're really not that bad for what they are. I mean, obviously they're a little tiny, they're a little quiet, but they actually have some decent enough quality to them. I'll play a blip of another song, 
but I'm not going to let it play for very long because I believe it's going to cause a copyright issue, so I'm just going to play it briefly. It's not what it seems. This isn't a dream. Probably long enough. I don't want to go too crazy with it, but you get the idea here. But yeah, well and truly, like this would make a good jukebox if it wasn't for the dying software support for Windows Vista these days. Again, I don't know how long we, we've got left with Vista in and of itself for Spotify. They say that we're ending support for your operating system in an upcoming release. I'm not sure how true that is. I mean, at least as right now is concerned. Yeah, there's no images loading on the album art covers and for artists, for really anything. But the main core functionality that we're looking for is the music playback, and that at least works fine. So, I mean, I guess if that keeps working, then cool. I'll actually take that for what it is. But, you know, you get the idea. Um, I need to keep this open so that way I can actually go in and set this to where it's not going to open on startup because it's kind of annoying. So yeah, as far as this machine is concerned, um, that's all I really have to demonstrate. I mean, we could go and open up Microsoft Office, but I mean, woo, you've seen Microsoft Office before, I'm sure. So I don't think I need to go reiterating that, but I would probably do a quick keyboard typing test just so you get a bit of an idea as to how the key switches sound. So I'll just go ahead and I'll open up something like Notepad here and try typing on it just for the sake of giving you all a little bit of something, hopefully without the wind noise in the background because I have my window open. So yeah, it's really not all that bad. It would actually be a pretty comfortable keyboard for typing on for long periods of time, whether that's uh, useful for you or whatever, but and anyways. So that's about all I can say right now for the HP 2133. I'm not sure exactly what kind of content I will make on a machine like this. I just wanted to get that video done on a machine like this for so long because I had it many years ago and I never did get the chance to make a video about the one that I had, which was like the ultra premium configuration where everything was maxed out and it was definitely in greater or, uh, even better condition than this machine was honestly had the bigger battery you know the same high resolution display it had the vista business on it the faster hard drive the best cpu and so on and so forth like it had all the bells and whistles but unfortunately that machine is gone um, it's just unfortunate but it is what it is at least have the machine that i have which is kind of a mid-spec model not terrible to the extent that it's a complete joke but it's definitely not fast but it's definitely usable and it definitely shows the kind of era that this netbook comes from, which was definitely a way different time of performance and build quality for sure. But I think I'm gonna go ahead and wrap up this video for now since that's all I can really demonstrate on a machine like this. So hopefully you liked what you saw and if you did, well then click like down below. If you didn't like it so much, well then you also know what to press. Get subscribed and I'll catch you all in the next video.